Hello, today we're going to cover moments or talks for A-level physics. A moment, which is essentially a talk, is the turning effect of a force. Ordinarily, if you have an object and you apply a force, force, then you will cause that object to move, to accelerate, uh, but in a linear direction over a certain distance. But if you take that same object, or here is the object, and you pin it to the uh, board through a particular pivot point or axis, and then you apply a force, instead of this simply going up linearly, it will of course rotate around the pivot point. And a moment of a force requires a turning point, sometimes called a pivot, sometimes called a fulcrum, sometimes called an axis around which to turn. So if we take a plank and here is a fulcrum or turning point, pivot point, and I stand on the end here and I'm going to have a force acting downwards which will be my mass times gravity and let's say that I'm a distance d from the pivot point. Then the definition of the moment of a force is that it is equal to the force times the distance from the pivot point, which in this case will be my mass times g times d, the distance from the pivot point. Now if you have a force, sorry, if you have an object which is either at rest or traveling with uniform motion, that means that there is no net force on it. So the sum of all forces must be zero if there is no acceleration. And it is also true that if there is to be either uh, no movement or no acceleration, the sum of all moments must be equal if you are going to have equilibrium. And so we can come to the famous seesaw. Here is my seesaw. There's my balance point in the middle, and I'm going to put four people on the seesaw. And uh, they're each going to have a different mass, and they're each a different point away from the uh, fulcrum. This person is mass M1, M2, M3, and M4. So consequently, the forces acting down will in each case be the mass times G. And we're going to assume that the distance from the fulcrum of the first is A, the distance here is B, the distance here is C, and the distance here is D. And so what we can say is that the masses on this side are achieving a turning effect in the clockwise direction. The masses on this side are trying to achieve a turning effect in the anti-clockwise direction. And if there is to be no net mo movement, if that seesaw is to balance, then the sum of the moments must be equal. In other words, the moments on this side must balance the moments on that side. And that means that M1G times its distance from the fulcrum, A, plus M2G times its distance from the fulcrum, B, must equal mg3, sorry, m3g times its distance from the fulcrum c plus m4g times its distance from the fulcrum d. Now, you do not have to take moments about the fulcrum. You could take a moment about any point. You could, for example, take it about a point b. And then you would say, that the moments about point B will be this mass times its distance from B, plus this mass times its distance from B, plus this mass times its distance from B, plus this mass times its distance from B, and you will say you've got four masses and they are all causing the seesaw to swing in an anti-clockwise direction. Something must have gone wrong. There is no balancing force. But we will have forgotten a force. There is, of course, a normal force acting up on the fulcrum itself. 
because just look at, never mind about the turning, just look at the forces. We've got one, two, three, four forces acting downwards. That should mean that the whole seesaw should fall through the floor. Indeed, it should accelerate through the floor if there's a net force on it. But of course, we've forgotten Newton's third law. To every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if there is a force which is equated to these four forces acting downwards, since the seesaw doesn't actually accelerate, uh, it must be that there's an equal and opposite normal force which is acting through the uh, pivot point of the seesaw. And that will be equal to m1g plus m2g plus m3g plus m4g acting upwards. Well, why didn't we take that into account in this formula here? Well, because if you think of it, these are the moments the force times the distance from the fulcrum. And we were regarding the pivot point as the balancing point here. What is the moment of the normal force through that pivot point? The answer is, it is zero, because the distance from the pivot point to the pivot point is zero. So n times zero is zero. Any force which acts through the pivot point doesn't count in terms of moments. So choose your pivot point carefully so that you can dispense with some of the forces. So if we are going to be unwise enough to pick this as a pivot point, then yes, we do this plus this distance, plus this times this distance, plus this force times this distance, plus this force times this distance, all of which are acting in an anti-clockwise direction. But we then have to say minus n times this distance, i.e. half the length of the seesaw, n, which is m1g plus m2g plus m3g plus m4g, times the distance from n to the pivot point we have selected, which is b, and that will come out exactly as we had before. But it is wise to pick your pivot point where it makes most sense. We're now going to move on to levers and what I'm going to do here is to show that if you take a plank and you have a pivot point and you have a, a weight which has a force mg, it has a mass m, and I push down on that end with a force f, and let's say that the distances respectively are a on this side and b on this side, that's the distance from the mass to the fulcrum or the force to the fulcrum, then I've said that in order to balance this, the moments on each side should uh, be equal. So the force times the distance on the left-hand side is mga, and that must equal the force times the distance on the right-hand side. Now, suppose a equals b. Well then, if A equals B, you've got that Mg equals F. And so in order to balance this force, I would need to supply a force equal to the value of that force in order to balance it. That makes sense. And if I wanted to lift this weight here, I would have to give a force slightly greater than Mg in order to push this up into the air. But suppose that B equals 2A. In other words, the length B is twice the length of A. Well, let's take this formula here. We've now got that MGA is equal to F times B, but B is 2A. And now we've got, if you reduce that, that F is equal to MG over 2. So if B is twice the length of A, then the force that I need to push down in order to balance this weight here is only half the value of the weight itself. So I can balance a heavy weight with only half of that weight in terms of force, provided the distance from the fulcrum is twice as much as that from the weight. And of course, what you'll readily see is that if B is equal to, say, 10A, then the force I need to balance 
the weight mg is mg over 10. I only need a tenth of the force in order to balance a heavy weight. And of course, if I apply just a tiny bit more than F, I will actually lift that weight up off the ground. And this gave rise to a famous saying by Archimedes, give me a lever and I will move the world. One assumes he meant I will move the earth. But his point was that if you have a lever, which means you have to have some kind of fulcrum, and you balance the whole earth at one end, he says, I can move the earth. I can cause the earth to be lifted, provided I've got a pivot point, and provided, of course, that the distance from my force to the pivot point, B, is sufficiently greater than A that you get this effect. If B was a million times greater than A, then you would only need a millionth of the force to lift up the earth. In fact, you'd need more than a million because even a millionth wouldn't do it. But if you have a long enough plank stretching out far enough, Archimedes says, I could move the world. Now there's a term called mechanical advantage, MA, which is simply defined as the load divided by the effort. So the load is the mass or the weight you're trying to lift and the effort is the effort you have to put in to balance it. In the case of the example we did recently, the load was mg and when b was twice a, we said that the effort was just mg over 2 and that comes to 2. The mechanical advantage was 2. If we had the example where B was 10 times A, then this effort would just be mg over 10, and the mechanical advantage would be 10. It's a kind of measure of efficiency. It's saying that in order to lift a, a weight mg, you only have to apply a tenth of that weight in force if the mechanical advantage is 10. So if we draw the picture again we've now got this is the load and that's going to be mg it's a mass m and so the force acting downwards is mg my effort is going to be called um, the force here acting downwards and once again we're going to have distances a and b from the load to the fulcrum and from the effort to the fulcrum and now we can say that the load times A is equal to the effort times B. And then since mechanical advantage is load over effort, we can say that load over effort is equal to B over A. And that's the mechanical advantage. So when B was twice A, the mechanical advantage was Two. When B was 10 times A, the mechanical advantage was 10. And what you'll see is that as B increases, the effort that you have to put in decreases. And that's the principle of a lever, basically, that you want to increase the distance from the fulcrum in order to increase the mechanical advantage in order to make the effort that you have to put in much less. So let's take, there are three types of levers. Here's the first type of lever. This is the lever where you have the fulcrum in the middle, you have the effort on one side and you have the load on the other side. And the distances are A and B as usual. And now we have that L times A is equal to E times B. Load over effort is equal to B over A. And now you can see that depending on how you design this, B over A could be greater than one, in which case the mechanical advantage is good, or B over A could be less than one. If you made B very small and A very large, you would be mad. But if you did, 
then the uh, mechanical advantage would be less than one. You'd actually have to put more effort in than the load you were trying to lift. So if you're sensible, of course, you'll make sure that B is greater than A. Here is lever number two. Lever number two is where you put the pivot point at one end and then you have the load acting down in the middle and the effort acting up at the end. Now that is just a wheelbarrow. Here's a wheelbarrow. The load is in the wheelbarrow acting down. The wheel itself acts as the fulcrum and you lifting up the handlebars of the wheelbarrow represent the effort. And here, of course, the distance of the load from the fulcrum is A again, and the distance of the effort from the fulcrum is B again. And once again, load over effort is going to be B over A, because load times A equals effort times B. And you can see that in this arrangement, B is always going to be greater than A because the handlebars are always going to be further away from the pivot point than the load that's acting down. So the mechanical advantage in this particular arrangement is always greater than one. It's always going to be slightly easier to use a wheelbarrow to lift a heavy weight than to try and lift it directly. And then here is the third type of lever. This is one where we again have the pivot point at one end, but now we try and push it up in the middle and we have the load acting down um, furthest away. And if we use the same convention, we'll have the load a distance A away from the fulcrum and the effort a distance B away from the fulcrum. Again, we can say that L times A equals E times B. L over E is the mechanical advantage, which is equal to B over A. But now you can see that B is always less than A because the effort is nearer the fulcrum than the load. And so the mechanical advantage in this arrangement is always less than one, which means you have to put in more effort than the load you're trying to lift. So that's not a very good arrangement. In fact, you'd have to be mad to adopt that arrangement. Unfortunately, that is precisely the way nature has designed our limbs, in particular, our arms. Here is an arm bending at the elbow. And in our hand, we're going to be holding a heavy weight, which is going to be the load. In addition, of course, we've also got the problem that the arm itself um, has a mass and as we've shown in another video you can regard the whole of that mass to be acting down from the center of mass. So this is the mass of the load. This is the mass as it were of your, or rather this is the weight of the load. This is the uh, load associated with, the, with just the mass of your arm. And this is the fulcrum which is your elbow which is able to bend. And the thing that is providing the effort are your muscles, which are here, and they are acting upwards. They're providing the effort. So the load is a distance A1 away from the pivot point. The center of mass of your arm is a distance A2 away from the pivot point. But the effort is a very, very tiny distance B away from the pivot point. And so once again, you're going to have the moments of the forces acting downwards, which in this case will be the load times A1, the load times the distance from the pivot point, plus, let's call it your arm, times A2. A is the force associated with your arm, so it will be the mass of your arm times G. And that's going to equal the effort that your muscle is putting in to pull your arm up times the distance B from the fulcrum. And let's just do a little sum to work out what that might be. Let's assume that the load 
is the equivalent of 80 newtons. So mg is 80 newtons. And let's assume that your arm has 20 newtons. So mass of your arm times g is 20 newtons. Let's assume that a1, the distance from your elbow to your hand, is about 40 centimetres, which is 0.4 metres. Let's assume that a2, the midpoint of your arm to your elbow, is about 20 centimetres, that's 0.2 metres. And let's finally assume that the distance b, that is, the distance from where the effort is applying, where your muscles are pulling up to the um, fulcrum, is a very small distance indeed, say 4 centimetres, 0.04 meters. Plug that into this equation here and you will get that 80 times 0.4 plus 20 times 0.2 is equal to the effort, which we don't yet know, times 0.04. And that you will find 80 times 0.4 is 32, 20 times 0.2 is 4, is equal to the effort times 0.04. So you get 36 divided by 0.04 is effort. And that is equal to, sorry, 36 divided by 0.04 uh, is effort. And that is 900 Newtons. So your body has to do, your muscle in particular, has to do 900 Newtons worth of force upwards in order to lift, in this case, a load of 80 newtons in your hand because it's also got to lift the weight, the force associated with the mass of your own arm. So the mechanical advantage in this case is very, very, very much less than one. It's very inefficient, uh, but it's the way nature has designed it. Finally, I want to talk about a pair of forces, uh, which is called a couple. And this would be typically a situation where you're trying to undo a wheel nut. So here's a wheel nut on the wheel of your car. It's been tightened up very uh, tightly and consequently you're going to need to put a lot of effort in uh, to get it undone. You're going to use a double-handed spanner and you're going to apply a force in this direction like this. So both forces are going in the same direction. You're trying to spin this anti-clockwise in order to undo the wheel nut. Both sides are going anti-clockwise and we'll assume that the distance from the pivot point is D on either side. And now we've not got, this is not of course equilibrium, we are actually trying to turn the nut so that it gets undone. And so the total moment of uh, the forces is going to be, let's assume that we've got force F here and of course an equal force F here, then we're going to have FD plus FD is the total moment. And that's also called, incidentally, a torque, which is represented by the letter tau. So tau is equal to 2 times FD, which can also be written as F times 2D. And 2D, of course, is just the length of the spanner. So F times L. So if you were to have a double-handed spanner of length 0.5 meters overall and you were to apply a force of 30 newtons at each end then the total torque would equal force times total length of spanner which is 30 times 0.5 which equals 15 newton sorry, capital N, Newton meters. Right, the torque is always in Newton meters because it is a force, which is measured in Newtons, times a length, which is measured in meters.